Open up your eyes and see all the fun and mystery. It's an African adventure, Darren and Destiny. Bam! <laughs> the Adventures of Darren and Destiny. That's right. Uh, the children's book series. And uh, that's, I'm not talking about that right now, but just want to let you know it's available. DarrenandDestiny.com or Amazon. Be sure to hit that like, that uh, the like button, the subscribe button. Be sure to share because what I'm about to talk to you right now uh, is going to break a lot of this stuff down. As a matter of fact, I'm glad that I shared that with you because what inspired those books is the need for us to re-educate ourselves about what we've been taught about Africa and our connection to it and all of that. So the theme of what I want to talk about right now is who told you? Who told me? Who is giving the information? Consider the source. Too often, we just go with something because someone said it and we take it to be fact. And oftentimes, the, uh, the places where we get this information from, from people who either have a bias so they have an agenda to make sure that we don't get this information uh, or have certain pieces of information accurately and, and they're, they benefit from it some kind of way. Or they've never been themselves. They were taught by somebody else who told them, who told them, who told them. And now we're just, you know, picking this stuff up, uh, stuff up along the way and running with it as if it's accurate to our own detriment. And that's what I'm saying you know, for those who are following my journey, when you see me purchasing land in Ghana and you see me back in the States doing different things, I can go back and forth with no problem. That's one of the benefits of being a part of the African, I guess, American diaspora because we have the ability to go back and forth. But when you understand imperialism and colonization, the whole goal of imperialism and colonization was to make sure that the people stay put psychologically and then once you get them psychologically, they're going to stay put physically, financially, religiously, if that's even the correct word for it. They're going to stay put. And so for more than 40 years, I stayed put because I was listening to what someone else told me or I trusted in the media. Uh, I watched a movie. I watched a documentary. I didn't question it. And so because of that, you know, it, it led me to basically a life of stagnation or negative feelings towards the African continent because of what someone told me and or and some of it may have been accurate but a lot of it was one-sided so i hear it on both sides so there are narratives that are told in um in, in different parts of africa about so-called african americans and they said well those african americans are angry those african americans uh i always see you know people white people this particular way those african americans they uh they, you know, they, you know, they, they're fighting, they're killing, they're gangbangers, they're druggers, they're pregnant, they're all these other kind of things. And so, as I've said in other talks, it's not that that is entirely untrue. What it is is that that is the segment of the story that has been magnified in all of those millions of satellite dishes pumping into the homes and and in, in, in different parts of Africa. So, if what you see on the media, if the news broadcast, if CNN comes in and says you know, this story and this is what's happening in America. And if, if what you see all the time is uh, black uh, Americans angry and upset fighting in movies and, and all of that, then that shapes a narrative to say, oh, that must be what they do because this is all we see. And so what I'm trying to help those on the continent of Africa understand is that that's not all of it. As a matter of fact, we have more similarities than we do differences. And so if that's all, and you got to also ask yourself, who controls the media that's coming into your mind? Who's controlling those images and those narratives? Nine times out of 10, the people who are controlling it, funding it, and allowing it to be disseminated on a wide scale do not look like those who are being portrayed. And so when you actually come and you get around a diverse group of so-called African-Americans, you begin to understand that we are as diverse as the continent of Africa. Just like the, the Timene are different from the Maasai, who are different from the Zulu, that's how different African Americans are. If, if we were to try, and, and now, let me flip that around a little bit because what ends up happening, the same negative things that are said about African Americans in Africa, that's the same narrative 
that is told to many of us who are in the African diaspora about Africans. And for most, many of us, we don't understand the cultural diversity and that one ethnic group can be very different from the next ethnic group. But if all they show in the Western media is somebody got kidnapped, somebody got shot, somebody got uh, as a corruption, something bad happened. And if that is the narrative, then that's what they pump into our minds because we haven't taken the time to go and get to know one another on a serious level. Or let's say we did meet somebody from Africa. Now, keeping in mind, this is where a mature person begins to think and they stop and they say to themselves, you know, okay, now, now, most people don't realize, again, and when I say I say this generally because because I'm, I talk to so many people and I read the comments, and it's clear that a whole lot of people don't, you know, get this thing. They just kind of run with it. If you stop and you think about it, by the time we meet each other, so if you, if you like, when I took my first trip to Africa, I'd been told my whole life, hey, those Africans don't like us. They don't like us. They don't like us. So I'm going to Ghana on my first trip, which is one country out of many countries in Africa, with, with 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 some guards up, they don't like us. They don't like us. But I never, I never stopped and asked, who told me this? I never did. I just went with that in my mind. And I was guarded because I heard. I heard. And I was one of the few that was willing to get on the plane and go see. I was one of the few that was willing to get on the plane and go push past what I heard to go see for myself. So what I see in here and on many, many channels and everything, people who had never even been, maybe they met some people who came from Africa, who picked up a Western mindset or who, who, had, who had a classist mindset, who came over with a particular attitude based on what they were told about us. And they didn't take the time. They're coming over, saying their parents are telling them, you know, for whoever these people are, you know, I'm, I'm just speaking about that particular group of people. This doesn't represent everybody, to be clear, uh, coming over. They're coming over with a particular mindset about those who are already there based upon what somebody told them. They saw it on the news. They heard maybe they had an encounter with one or two people, and now they judge a whole 43 million people based upon their encounter with one or two or three, five, ten people. Flip same thing around. Many of us will do the same thing. We will judge 1.6 billion people based on the encounters with 10 who come from one country or who are part of one ethnic group without understanding it. And so that is a play out of the imperialism playbook to keep people divided, to keep them not trusting each other, looking sideways, doing this, that, and the other, bouncing around, looking sideways, all these other kind of things happening and so for the people who actually go and take the time to sit down and learn and experience, more often than not, if they go with the right mindset, they're able to balance those things that we've been told with reality. Because again, like I said, not that those things that we've been told are entirely untrue. It's that much of what we have been told has one side. And that side has been broadcasted for as long as broadcasting could be allowed. That side has been put out, put out, put out into the atmosphere. And then we repeat it. And that's why I push back so strongly when people try to say, well, yeah, man, they don't like us. And, and they'll come and man, they don't like us over there. And they sold us into slavery. Who told you they sold you into slavery? with your never having been in slavery behind self. But who told you that? Let's just say you were, all right. Who told you they, them Africans, sold you into slavery? Well, the history books in schools, they told us, and, and, and the black person, our black leader, told us they sold us into slavery, and, and, I, and that's what they did, them Africans. We don't stop and ask, now who's giving me this information? Who's this so-called history teacher that's telling me this? Many people didn't even know anything about the, the whole story until Roots came on back in 70, what, 70 something? Who told you? And then to generalize it to the point of saying, well, this whole, everybody on the whole continent of Africa was involved in that. 
everybody, every every ethnic group, every tribe, they all sold everybody. They sold their brothers and sisters into slavery. Who told you that? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that some of that isn't true. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that if people don't give you the complexity, the full context of the story, understanding what was contributing and the players in the game and all of that and how we, even in a modern context, what we try to do is take it from our context and put it in a context 500 years ago. Now, in order for someone to catch themselves and say, wait a minute, I'm thinking in terms of today and now projecting it on the past without understanding all of the nuances and the differences and, the, and, and, and cultural challenges that might have been going on during that time, I'm now thinking in terms of black and white when without understanding that black and white was a, 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 a basically a cultural construct that was created by the imperialists and the colonizers to, to, to do exactly what it's done for the past five, 600 years to form this wedge of division based upon skin color. And not only black and white, but then you have the colorism that takes place even within the different ethnic groups. So when you now start to understand that this is bigger than people just selling people into slavery, and now a lot of people, once they realize that, it's troubling to them because they've realized, man, I've been believing some stuff all these years without even understanding the full story without even understanding the alliances and what was happening, it was, okay, well, either I align with you and get the arms or either this rival ethnic group because we really don't see it in black and white. We really just see it as territory and kingdoms and, and all of that. You know, We really don't see it the way we see it today. We don't see them as our brothers because it wasn't based upon skin color. So once you start getting the understanding of what was happening, now some of that edge comes off to say, okay, what was really going on here? And who was being sold into slavery? Why were they being sold into slavery? Did they understand all of it? Now, now enough for me, I'm like, after 400 years, you knew what was going on. I mean, slavery was big business um, in Africa. But guess what? A lot of people don't even know that there were three major slave trades happening. And there were other sl sub-slave trades. You had the European chattel slave trade. You had the trans-Saharan slave trade, which was going up and down and all around throughout uh, interior of Africa, and then you had the Arab slave trade. And the Arab slave trade uh, came before the uh, the European uh, chattel slave trade. Much of this went back to religion. Much of this went back to religion when you start going and diving even deeper because you even see the remnants, not even the remnants, you even see it today. And you see how people's minds are influenced based upon one particular, uh, you, you see whoever colonized, you see their religion still in place, who haven't dominated in, in even different parts of different countries. Most people don't even realize that the countries were recently formed. And when I say this meaning, 1885, Africa was carved up into different territories and the borders formed the countries we now know. Even after that happened, what, uh, what was interesting is that the countries still uh, were not formed until starting in, you know, into the 1900s, you started seeing where uh, countries actually started having their colonizer governments put in place. And in 1957, with Ghana and uh, Kwame and Chroma, then you started seeing the sub uh, below the Saharan Desert, you started seeing those countries starting to gain what was called independence, which was kind of like a, it was a pseudo-independence because the currency of many of the Francophone countries are still controlled by France. So if your currency is controlled by France, you cannot be independent. I don't care how you try to make your mind fooled into thinking otherwise, you cannot be independent if somebody else controls your money, controls your military, controls your government, controls your religion, controls your culture, controls your language. Now, you might be independent in your own thoughts and on an individual level, but as far as from a cultural and a systemic level, not independent even if they put it in paper, even if they say all these different things, even if they give the appearance, if you're still tied to the British Commonwealth, you're not independent. If you're still relying upon all of these other players to come in and give you the ability to do these different things, you're not independent. If you're getting beaten or if, if they are forcing you to learn a foreign language as your native language, as your national language, forcing it upon you, beating you into schools, or even, let's say they don't beat you into schools, let's say culturally you're just deemed to be um, 
uh, uneducated, if you don't speak the that that one particular language, if you're deemed uh, uneducated as a result of that, that's a problem. Now, what I, I heard um, when I was talking to Forsen, and he was talking about how he was beaten in school to learn English. Well, when I was talking to Terry, she talked about how people were beaten in school in the Congo to learn French. So same, you know, same kind of thing. But here's what's interesting. Because then this is what the argument I've heard a lot of people come back with. Well, you have a whole lot of different languages within uh, within these countries. A whole lot of different African languages in these countries. And the only way they're going to be able to communicate is if they pick one language. And, and, and that way, it makes it easier. So why the, why are they choosing a daggone colonizer language as the primary language? Well, well, in order for them to compete on the world stage, they have to be able to do X, Y, Z. I heard all of these different excuses. But at the same time, it was almost like nobody saw a problem with it. So maybe you can. Now, I'm, I'm one for people being multilingual and to have as many languages as they can under their belt. That's one of the things I admire about uh, the African continent is that many people are able to, to take multiple languages. And, and they speak multiple local languages and indigenous languages as well as multiple colonizing languages. And that really puts them at an advantage if they know how to do it because they can communicate on many different levels. The point of what I was observing is the fact that when people are discouraged from their native tongue, beaten, flogged, or whatever you want to call it for speaking their native tongue, and the people are okay with that, those people will never advance. Because what will end up happening, they'll be end up being stripped of their identity without even knowing it. And uh, there were other stories about people in, in some of the Francophone countries where they don't even see their native language as native language anymore. They actually believe they're French. They actually believe the, these, the people in Africa actually believe they are French. And so this horrible mind game, you know, all goes back to who told you? Who told your teachers? Who created the system that's educating you? Who created the system that is uh, uh, that created the religion, the system, the system of the religion that you follow? Who controls the currency that you spend every day? See, those are questions that when you begin to start asking those questions, now you start going beneath the surface and, and you start looking at things a little bit differently. And that's what I'm encouraged by because I'm starting to see where people say, wait a minute. That's right. W-A-Y-M-E-N-T. Wait a minute. <laughs> They're saying, hold tight. There's something more to this story. And so what I encourage each person to do is to not simply go with the flow of what people are telling you. Go see for yourself. And sometimes if you don't have the money to do it, you can get on YouTube and you can watch a whole lot of videos and you can kind of decipher, okay, that seems like that might be a little skewed one way and that might be a little skewed that way. The other thing that um, it helped me is that uh, one of the, uh, another thing I hear on the, uh, uh, on the continent of Africa is how a lot of people say our leaders, our leaders, our leaders are corrupt. Our leaders are poor. Our leaders are this, our leaders are that. And you almost have to admire the colonizer in the imperialist because their system is it runs flawlessly now because it's been imposed and indoctrinated on the people so much that it's almost like clockwork. I can go to any any one of the countries I've been to, and the first thing I can hear people complain about our leaders, our leaders, our leaders, our leaders. Now they do the same thing in America too, but I want to I want to make an interesting point here. Is that, and this is not just I'm not just referring to Africa. I'm really talking about. African American too, and Afro UK and everywhere else. If the people who educate you control the story, they sit down, they say, This is what we want you to know. This is how we're going to frame it. We understand psychology. We understand that we psychoanalyze people. We understand cultural pressures. We understand how religion plays a part in culture and how whatever the religion says, that's going to now, and if we indoctrinate people from a child from childhood and we raise them in these particular systems, by the time they figure out what happened, we have got we would have gotten X amount of dollars out of them, X amount of labor out of them, X amount of um cultural 
um, duplication out of them, whether it be by way of them having children and then imposing these same systems on them, or if they're in a position of influence, they'll now lead people into this. Uh, it's, 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 it's layers and layers and layers and layers of brilliant, and when I say brilliant, I'm not saying that it's a good thing. I'm just saying trying to help you to understand how cal calculating this is and really how brilliant it is where you don't even have to pick up a gun. You don't even have to drop a bomb because if you get into people's minds, they will do it to themselves. And they will say our governments, our presidents, our leaders are corrupt. They are this, they are that. All of that may very well be true. But if you don't understand the origins of where this comes from, or you don't put the origins side by side with it, the problem continues to metastasize. That's what ends up happening. And so you see a major metastasis all over the world of this cancer of imperialism. And the, same, the, the leaders get blamed, and then you move one leader out, but the system stays the same. It happens in America. That's why you see the same problems plaguing many black American cities, because the same system, the same system that's in place in Africa is the same system that's in place in these areas. And so the problem with black America is that we have been conditioned to see things in black and white. So we look at a black person and say, that person has my best interest without even digging deeper to understand the core of the person or the core of the system. How is it that someone can come into a city, a black city, and be all, and I talked about this in another talk, be all democratic, uh, mayors, governors, or just say mayor, city council, school board, um, police chief, everybody's black. And everybody's democratic. But somehow gentrification still happens. And not, not, a, not a Republican in sight, but crime continues to get out of control. Education continues, still wanes and is, is subpar. Economic opportunities seem to still keep um, evading. Same, same scenario, cycle after cycle after cycle. But Democratic, black, every, everything black, 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 everything in place. Scandal break loose, corruption. Same thing. So when you stop and you say to yourself, well, who's behind that? Who's controlling that? Hmm. Where's this independence? And really where independence comes from is independence of thought. Because if you're waiting for a broad cultural separation, a broad cultural uh, awakening, it will, you, nine times out of 10, you will not see it happen through one person or two people or however, how many people we saw happening in the past. It will have to take place on an inv individual level. And those people who see, you're going to now, going to start looking at having to raise yourself and take care of yourself and educate yourself because if you're waiting for the systems to do it for you, you're going to wake up in 20, 30, 40, 50 years frustrated, stuck, and trying to figure out what happened. That's why it's so good to see so many people educating themselves now because they recognize they won, they can't trust these systems to educate their children. They already live long enough to see, wait a minute, I've been hearing this same, these same wolf tickets and banana in the tailpipe for the past 20, 30, 40 years, and things still the same. So they're tired of it. And so I encourage people to say, listen, get a financial education, really understand the game you're in. What you're in is a financial game a global financial game. People want to make it about religion. If you want to, cool. Tie, tie the finances in that too. Make sure you don't leave that out of it because you can be sitting there praying all day long and praying for the wrong thing. See, some people don't like to hear that. But if you're going to be a prayer person, then if you're, going to, if you're a prophet and all these other kind of things, you ought to know this by now. What I'm saying, you ought to be able to tell, you should be telling your people, all these prophets running around talking about they prophet so-and-so and prophet this, that, and the third. How come you're not out here? The one, I'm talking about on a large scale. I'm not talking about that one in the back room somewhere that see, he said it, she said it over there. I'm talking about all these people out here, all these titles, all these preachers, pastors, and whatever else they got going on. How come they're not out here with all this prophetic insight and wisdom, knowledge, and all this kind of stuff, heard from this and that and heard from that and the third? How come they're not out here breaking this stuff down on the level of what's really going on? I'm not talking about this, this other stuff, this, the talking points that they've been paid off by the same players that's paying off the corrupt governments in Africa, paying off the corrupt governments in the black cities in America, and paying off the corrupt preachers who are still sitting up there telling the people, uh, uh, peace, peace, where there is no peace. 
still telling things and visions and stuff that they're making up in their own mind instead of saying, hey, listen, y'all, this is what's really going on. And now this is how you position yourself. Be a wise manager over the resources that you have. If you manage your resources well, then it will be more difficult to be taken advantage of. Understand the laws, understand the law, understand the tactics of the game and position yourself accordingly. Be just as shrewd as the man who was, he knew he was going to have to pay up. And he understood, oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. I need to do what I need to do. Let me go handle my business right now and be, become friends with those because my time is coming. I'm going to need to have to pay up some things. I'm about to get in. I'm about to lose some things. So I need to have some friends on the other side. Become just as shrewd as that person. You know, when you start to understand the parable of the talents and being able to manage one, two, and five and multiplying instead of waiting for someone to, instead of waiting for the thief to give back what was stolen, Take advantage of the resources that you have right in front of you. You might have, you have resources right in front of you that you could take advantage of. But in the meantime, just sitting there waiting, could you please give me back what you stole? Nothing wrong with asking, nothing wrong with demanding. But at the same time, have a, a, a multi-strategy approach saying, okay, listen, we don't know if the thief is going to give back what the thief has stolen and continues to steal. That's not the nature of the thief. The thief has guns, bombs, and, and can change the rules anytime the thief wants to change the rules. So we need to start becoming a little bit more strategic, especially since we've been educated in the thief system, that we need to be able to understand how the thief thinks and how the thief operates with smooth words, very clever, media, influence, ethnic conflicts, all of these other things, exploiting people's trauma, and when you begin to understand this, and I'm talking about from whether it's Africa, whether it's in South America, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in America, once you begin to understand that, you begin to position yourself differently, you begin to educate yourself differently, you begin to think differently, and you're willing to, you're willing to prioritize differently. And that's all I'm saying. So when you start to think, who told you this? Who wrote that history book? Who put that curriculum together? Who did all of that? See, when you start asking that question, now you start going down the rabbit hole. And some people say ignorance is bliss, but ignorance is also expensive. Ignorance is costly. Ignorance is one of the reasons why we can sit there and actually come out of our mouths and say, them people sold us into slavery. And they don't like us over there, and them Africans don't like us. And they don't know, and they don't like us. And, and that would be the same ignorance that I have somebody on the continent of Africa know about them, them black Americans. They gangbangers and get pregnant and they're drug addicts and they're violent and they hate white people and they hate everybody. And they, they're just mad at the world and they got problems. And those are the two narratives <laughs> when people meet each other. Now, again, some of it's true. But what I've experienced with my own eyes, what I've experienced by being in the presence of people on the continent of Africa, that's not my story. Now, does that mean that my every experience there has been uh, everything that I've expected? Absolutely not. But then I'd be silly to hold the people on the continent of Africa to, to a different standard than I would the people in America. The people in America, and some of them have stolen from me, lied on me, or the whole nine. But I don't blanket all people, all black Americans all white Americans, all whatever. I don't blanket everybody with that. Because if I did, I'd be showing my ignorance. And I'd also be missing out on my blessing. Because when you take it case by case, you give the opportunity, you, you allow yourself the opportunity to realize that you might have been wrong. Some people don't want that, so they'd rather hold on to the argument. They'd rather hold on, hold on, hold on for dear life to their offense without recognizing they could channel that energy, still be upset about injustice, still be upset about the thief stealing, killing and destroying, still be upset about all of that, but they could redirect their energy and focus it on educating themselves, learning how to play the game better. And that's really how you change the game. What does someone do on the continent of Africa with all those satellite dishes? That information, the access to information is still there. I was riding down the street and the brother was out there in Ghana in a crowd in rush hour traffic about 8 o'clock in the morning. 
and he had a whole like I guess a thing of books, like a like a shelf almost of books. And these books were some of the best books that someone could read as far as business, financial literacy, and all of that. And since they're in a Western system, if somebody gets that and learns how to manage their resources and, and changes the mindset, that's really where it begins. The mindset changes, then the resources get allocated differently. The hustle changes. I said, well, the information is out here, but what's lacking is the mindset. What's lacking, the it's not the hustle that's lacking, it's the mindset. And so if we focus our mindset appropriately, hey, we'll then begin to analyze when a thought comes into our mind about a, to generalize a group of people. Say, who told me this? Who taught me? And what's their real motive behind it? Who did it? Well, that's all I got to say for today, y'all. Consider that. If you're going to decolonize your mind, one, recognize that there's a problem, and the second, question everything. Question everything you've been taught and question those who have been teaching you. All right, now, I do want to invite you to the continent of Africa. You can definitely find out to go on some of these amazing trips, to have these five sensory experiences, to be a part of something that's truly, truly special. What we create, not just a trip, these are experiences, and we have the proof in the pudding. And I'm going to show you exactly what people have experienced, what they've had to say, and what you can experience. And what I want you to do, I want you to take them out of these videos, put yourself there, and I want you to make sure you join us on the continent of Africa for one of our many trips with MaximumImpactTravel.com. Take a look at this. Y'all know what to do before we depart. Subscribe. There you go, right there. Tell your friends about what we're talking about here on Maximum Impact with Jay Cameron. Share and then join us in Africa. Till next time. I want to welcome everybody to Tanzania. Does everybody know the theme for this trip is to what? Relax and what? And enjoy. enjoy. I, so I think everybody can tell we're going to have a good time already. <laughs> Why the heat and the balloon will rise. I came from the mud. There's dirt on my hands. Strong like a tree. Catch me howling at the moon. Oh, the drop line, it was, it was special. It was special. Open up your eyes and see all the wonder and mystery of an African adventure with staring in destiny. The, the relaxation, the peace that is here and compared to where I live is like. I mean, it's, it's amazing. All the butterflies. Well, I can't say I come from here, you know, but in my heart, this is it. It's just been beautiful being able to see all of the nature, all of the animals. It's, it feels like I'm in a movie. It was a, a learning experience just to see, you know, what the country looks like, how beautiful it is, to see that it's not what they show you on TV, um, it makes me want to see more of Africa, to learn more about Africa. Home, I had always done a lot of research on different parts of Africa, so I knew that some of the conceptions of Africa were not true. <laughs> we've seen it all, you hear me, birds, we, we've seen grass, we've seen it all. It'll change you within. I mean, you, you need to see it. I mean, you have to come. Well, hello? Hello? Where? Well, <laughs> good to see you. How you feeling? Last time I saw you, we got it.
If we can continue to find a way to bridge our differences and, you know, really, really, really come together, come to Africa, a lot of people really want to come here. This trip is not only a trip, but it really is an experience, and it's a learning experience. We've already learned so much just at the table, so I'm excited to be here, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I can't wait to continue to learn and just be with all of y'all. I quite didn't want to come to Africa, okay? And when I came, I got here, they were so kind. And I like, oh my gracious, then I got to meet you guys, and y'all started telling me about the trip. And I said, okay, this is gonna be fun. So now, I'm kind of excited. My wife, my wife said, well, you ain't got no excitement, but now I'm looking forward. So, hey, I'm hoping one day I can have the same testimony as you guys, and I'm just glad to be here. our second Maximum Impact experience. And I've been singing your praises, Jay, hands down. If you want to go to Africa, you got to do with Jay. There's no other way, no other way. And to be honest with you, when Renee, Jeff, and James signed up for this, I'm like, we can't let y'all go without us. And so here we are. It's just the most interesting thing in the world to come to a place such as this. It's beautiful. I mean, this is a beautiful resort. Uh, you all seem like very wonderful people. We all have something in common. We're all connected. We you know, we all are connected. Um, this is my second trip with Maximum Impact. I was in Ghana, July last year. And I brought my daughters with me. And they had a pretty rough experience because they had a lot of expectations that weren't realistic. But it took them two weeks to decompress and then to understand fully the magic that had happened on that trip. This is my mom, Claudette. And I'm very grateful that she brought me here. This is her first trip with the group, but she's been um, to Africa like three times. <laughs> and again, I'm very grateful that she brought me here. This is my second trip, and I'm going to have a third, a fourth, and a fifth. And I tell you, I'm still excited about all the things that I'm experiencing. And you would think I've been to many countries, I traveled a lot, but I've never been to a country where people look like me. Everywhere I went, I always had to fit in. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, was kind of traumatic for me after coming here and receiving, being received the way I was. I'm just looking forward to the whole itinerary. You know, it looks really, uh, I know it's really well organized and looking forward to the whole thing. So glad to meet everybody and look forward to meeting in person and talking. Hi, my name is LaDonia. Um, these are my parents and I'm really excited to be here. I'm 21 years old and thank you for hosting this trip and bringing us all here. Hi, I'm Faith Vincent Lettle. These are my parents. Um, I'm from Akron as well. This is my college graduation gift. Kids, I got 18 grandkids and, and nine great grandkids, and all of them want to come because I was so excited. Thanks to Jay, I was so oh, look. I walked through the streets of Philadelphia, lifting up. <laughs> of Africa. You got to go. I said, if you're Afro-American, you write that down on whatever form, you need to go to Africa. Travel a lot, and over the last couple years, I really wanted to do a deep discovery of Africa, all the African countries, and I found Jay, and I said, that's the way I want to do it. So we we're very, very uh, appreciative. This is my sister, Linda, and the reason I'm here is because Linda spoke so highly of the trip she was on in Ghana. Coming to Africa, I liked it. Something different. You can connect. Connecting with the people here, connecting with the workers here. I like that idea and that approach. So I wanted to come and see for myself. I remember it was November 2020 when Mr. J. Cameron visited us. It, it was during COVID pandemic. 
Imagine we have 32 rooms, but he was accommodated only one guest who was Jay Cameron. <laughs> Cameroon told me, I promise you, I'll bring you a group. Oh, well. yeah. okay. <laughs> so, on behalf of Airport Planet Lodge, we are here to express our sincere gratitude to host you here today. I can't imagine doing Africa without without um, being on a Maximum Impact Tour, because being with a group like this just adds so much more to it.